Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, we are Tactile. Uh, we're going to spend the next uh, 40, 45 minutes or so walking through uh, some of the success, success we've had uh, leveraging the Unity platform and the applications we've built uh, with it, uh, specific to uh, various industries. We've got uh, some text on some slides, a lot of video, uh, and we'll try to save some uh, time at the end for some questions. Full disclaimer, though, I have to tell you, I am not a developer. Uh, I do have my background in video games. I work for companies like Sega and Electronic Arts uh, before working at Microsoft for quite a while. And I left about a year ago to become the managing director of Tactile Europe. I'm based in Paris. Uh, my uh, colleague, Elena, is based in Minsk, Belarus. And like I said, over the next uh, 40 minutes or so, we'll walk you through uh, some of the work we've been able to achieve or do over the last couple of years. Uh, I guess even before we begin, this uh, presentation was delivered as a webinar uh, with Unity about a month ago. Just want to show of hands. Did anyone happen to watch that? OK, great. There might be some repeats in here. Uh, I'm a big believer in plagiarism, so I, I, I stole it from my US colleagues. Uh, but I'll add my own little European flavor to it. Uh, I like it. Obviously, I'm American, but I'm based uh, over here. Uh, and what we do is we provide uh, solutions that optimize workforce enablement using uh, spatial computing. So a lot of people talk about digital transformation uh, and where it typically takes place is you know, in a room with the marketing folks, in a room with the folks that are driving all the uh, processes inside of a company, certainly within IT, uh, but a really underserved uh, component of digital transformation uh, is with the frontline worker. Um, you can imagine you're working on a factory floor, You've got all these folks in the office telling you what to do, but you don't really have a seat at the table in terms of determining how digital transformation can help you do your job better. Uh, and so with our solutions, we're able to bring uh, those uh, digital uh, frontline workers or frontline workers to the digital uh, transformation table and have them uh, create some agency and actually have some feedback into how their company is transforming itself for the better. Um, we've deployed our solutions, uh, manufacturing, energy and utilities, uh, government, defense, uh, transportation. Uh, the ones that we've focused on here in Europe uh, touch all of those. I'm uh, very happy to report. And uh, our headquarters are in Seattle, Washington. A couple of us are ex-Microsoft, we freely admit it. Uh, and then we have folks that we pulled from all different companies uh, with some fantastic developer resources in Minsk, uh, Belarus. Uh, and led uh, by our uh, main developer team in Tucson, Arizona. So, I was told this would work. Okay, perfect. Oh, so right. So when we think about problems that are facing industrial organizations, um, it's relatively obvious, but I think it makes a lot of sense to kind of talk over uh, the challenges these folks are, are facing. Certainly, we are either providing the automation or very much part of the team that provides automation that is trickling down uh, into these various industries. Um, with that, a lot of emphasis on IoT, better analytics. Um, we're seeing more and more, or better and better promise of what 5G is actually going to deliver. Um, and with that, we're creating some very specialized products at a manufacturing level. So you get specialized SKUs, you might just do one or two runs of a product and then you're done. And that entire changeover has to happen. Well, it couldn't happen without automation, it couldn't happen without AI. So we're seeing more and more technology, really more complexity entering into these workforces. Um, the scariest stat uh, is that over the next five years across all industries, up to 30% of people are retiring or leaving the workforce. And what I like to say is, you take a subject matter expert who's been on that factory floor for 30 years, they walk out the door, their brain walks with them, the tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars of training that has gone into that individual walks out the door with them as well. At the same time, if you hand a 20-year-old a 250-page paper manual, they'll hand it right back to you because they grew up with one of these in their face and they don't even know how to transfer the written word to what they're actually trying to do. And plus, it just doesn't look that fun. You know, if you're spending all your time on one of these and you've got to read a 250-page manual, you might not even want to take that job. And so we're seeing a huge problem at the front end in terms of getting people excited about these type of roles or, or jobs or careers, really, and the retention. So it's a, it's a big issue. Um, and to that, <clears throat> there are way more job openings uh, than people seeking work. You know, thank God for the internet, right? Everyone's very excited about what the future holds or what the future has brought to them today. 
But working at that wastewater management plant doesn't seem quite so exciting anymore when you're living, or at least viewing, an Instagram life. So anything that these industries can do to actually provide an acceptable career for younger individuals is very, very important, not only for their own survival, but in a lot of cases, these companies are driving the turbines that give us all electricity so that we can code on our computers. So it's absolutely critical that we get people excited and trained up to be able to take these roles. So to the rescue, spatial computing, right? Well, to a certain extent, yes. So one of the things that we found within our development is if you can make training or operations a little sexier, a little, ex a little bit more exciting, provide that frontline worker with a little bit more agency, you get people fully invested in what they want to, or what you'd like them to do and what they themselves would like to do. To that, there are some four really key areas that we're seeing that spatial computing provides uh, advantages around. So remote assistance, I think, is, is, is critical. Uh, you know, Microsoft has done a great job in, in creating remote assistance uh, for HoloLens. Um, we leverage that on our platform. We're also in the process of creating our own remote assistance for our products. Um, training and task guidance, uh, I think that really the best use case of AR today is where you can actually give instructions to people that hover over the actual machine that they're working on. So that is absolutely key. The collaborative visualization, certainly being able to bring people together to focus on a problem jointly, uh, collaboratively, uh, I think is, is absolutely huge. And then the contextual data access. So <clears throat> what's really happening in that workplace? What is that IoT data? What are those sensors, those machines telling us? Is it safe to approach this machine or not? Do I need to wait for this manufacturing run to end before I do a change cycle? All of this is being uh, communicated much more clearer today than, than ever before. So, with all four of those in mind, uh, we created Manifest, but I'm one slide ahead, excuse me. <laughs> when we think about what if an expert could do anything, um, I would think, we had a brief chat about this earlier, has everyone seen The Matrix? I would, I would assume everyone has seen The Matrix. Never seen The Matrix, okay. You absolutely have to see this movie, and I know you're joking, okay. Everyone's seen The Matrix, everyone must remember this scene with Neo and Trinity, they're stuck on the roof, They've got to get out of there. There's a helicopter. Neo turns to Trinity and says, do you know how to fly that thing? And she goes, not yet. She puts a call in to uh, Hank, I think. I'm trying to remember. I think it's Hank. And then he uploads uh, the, uh, the ability to fly this helicopter. They fly off, and the movie continues. Well, we're not quite there yet, uh, but we're certainly on that path. Uh, and on that path, we have created and I apologize because I'm getting some clicker issues, Manifest. So I can talk a little bit about Manifest, and I'm actually going to read from a script I wrote earlier, but our core solution allows for simple, on-the-job authoring of step-by-step -step instructions of subject matter experts in a checklist format, leveraging video, photos, voice text, and digital twins. That all sounds great, but why don't we see it in action? So this is a video that we shot with the King County Wastewater Management Treatment Facility located in the Puget Sound, just outside of Seattle. They service Seattle and the surrounding area. Again, if you were to make a list of the 10 sexiest jobs you could ever have, working in wastewater management probably wouldn't crack the top 10. But somehow we did make it a little bit more exciting. And so let's see how we did that. One more. Okay. Hopefully this, yes. Okay, so this is Denise. She's been working at the wastewater management facility for quite some time. We gave her about a five minute training on HoloLens, another five minute training on Manifest, and then we let her rip. She was able to create a step-by-step -step instruction guide on how to change the oil pump on this generator. She's able to use the video capabilities of the HoloLens to shoot first person video. She then drags and drops a pointer pointing exactly to the widget that she wants that step to correspond to. She then follows through the entire operation and captures everything she does. And she's able to, on the fly, spend about two minutes per step. And after 20 minutes, it was done. You might have briefly seen our web portal at the very end there. It's, we should probably extend that part of the video just a little bit. That allows her to import ancillary data. So there might be a video that already exists in a training manual they would want to put in as a step. Or they might want to put in a second uh, 3D digital twin. 
we can do that as well. But what we've really tried to do is make authoring uh, remove all of us from the equation. We don't want any developers involved in it at all. We want the subject matter expert, that frontline worker, to feel comfortable enough with our software, the corresponding hardware, to be able to do it on the fly. And averaging two minutes per step, you can imagine after about 30 minutes, you can capture most operations and certainly most uh, repair jobs. And you get everything you need to do where some idiot like me, proud idiot, can put on a HoloLens, a Magic Leap, an iPad, and walk through that entire repair operations and probably be pretty successful at it. And if I'm not the first time, I watch that video again or I read that step again. So again, I have agency to be able to learn as well as I do to create. So I'm going to show you some other examples. And I think I said at the beginning, uh, this is a video heavy presentation. Um, so we're going to talk about some of the things we're doing in architecture, engineering, and construction. Um, at first, just a show of hands. How many people have played around with the HoloLens? Fantastic. OK, great. How many people have played around with Magic Leap? OK, we need more Magic Leap numbers. Come and join us at the Magic Leap stand, where you can uh, kick the tires on Manifest uh, today, tomorrow, and Thursday. Um, and then we're also on iPad as well. So with that, uh, in the, I'm sorry, your upper left quadrant, this is some work we did with a product we're demoing with Magic Leap today called Hollow Maps. It's actually a part of Manifest. And we work with the Cleveland Cavaliers when they were building their new stadium and needed to look for uh, continued investment uh, and sponsorship opportunities. So we created a 3D map. Uh, and then we had various vendors come in. And uh, we were able to zoom into the map and show exactly where their stores could be placed. So as the venue is being built, they're trying to attract restaurants and other uh, partners into the site. And they used our application not only to wow the city of Cleveland, uh, but also uh, the various people that would actually be working inside the facility and, and partnering with them from a business perspective. That's some work that we did uh, a couple years ago, actually. And we've now woven that into Manifest. And I'll show you an example of that in just a second. OK, the magic clicker. So now we should be here, Utilidata. So a little similar to what we did with Cleveland, but Utilidata uh, wanted to uh, show what it would be like to uh, create uh, some more uh, power uh, facilities uh, in Ohio. Um, this is a really good example of showing what, how, or how IoT data can be overlaid on a map to give people an interesting perspective on exactly what's happening in the real world. Of course, they're using this for presentation purposes only, um, but we'll be weaving it into a real-time solution. They wanted to show what it's like to have a, to pull additional power in from a different part of the grid to be able to support uh, maybe more TVs running as a Super Bowl or something, uh, as well as what it would look like from a blackout perspective. Again. Spatial computing kind of not only answering the questions people might already have, but really putting them in an environment where they can come up with questions they didn't even know they were going to have, and then have a very active uh, collaborative conversation around solving whatever issues have been raised. Uh, we're next going to move on to some work we did with the University of Queensland. This is running on iPad, quite clearly. So iPad was a great device choice for uh, UQ uh, because they wanted something that people could just grab in an emergency. So this is a fire panel. Um, if there's a fire happening somewhere on the campus, 90% of the time you're going to have the person that can respond to it exactly as they should on site. Sometimes you might not. So they wanted a solution that an expert could author, but then anyone else could get up and run. And so they're able to see the instructions over the uh, actual panel, because we're doing a, a kind of a QR code and it's spatially oriented with all the instructions on a step-by-step -step level in terms of what it took to mitigate uh, any issues that might be popping up. And our fourth example takes us back to King County. So this is an earlier uh, video that we shot uh, from, excuse me, an earlier time. This is a trainee. That is a belt thickening device. <laughs> there's, some, there's a third word in there. I don't remember what it is right now. Um, relatively, I'm not going to say a dangerous device, but lots of moving parts. Probably not the cleanest. Uh, they want to make sure that people absolutely understand what they're about to get into. And so they have a little certification exam uh, that people are required to go through. Typically, they have to take that machine offline. 
and then walk people through the various steps so that they get their certification to be able to work on it. What we were able to do is create a digital twin. First at miniature, so you can see all the steps of operation, and then at scale. And we placed it in a conference room about the size of this stage. And so that individual was able to get a great familiarity with how that device works, the various hazards, et cetera, pass a, security ex or a safety exam, and then be able to access that machine and work on it pretty much the same day. So super, super happy with the work that we've been able to do with King County, and it continues to grow. So why did King County approach us? So their, their problems are, are, are pretty universal. Um, about three years ago, they had a disaster where they had to release uh, wastewater into the Puget Sound. So Puget Sound is a combination of a lake and uh, the Pacific Ocean. Uh, so a bad scene. You can see it up here in this picture on the left. So you can imagine thousands, if not millions of gallons of wastewater pour, pouring into the Puget Sound. Huge environmental disaster. Uh, a bunch of people got fired. Uh, but in the post-mortem, they realized that only two people knew how to mitigate that type of disaster in the entire company. That's unacceptable. So they came to us to say, hey, listen, how do we improve our operational readiness with the tools that you guys are providing? Um, again, in the same post-mortem, mortem, they determined that a lot of their training materials were outdated. Even if the person had been able to find the right manual, it wasn't up to speed. Because anyone who's done anything in terms of technical writing or technical manual creation, you know it's good for about two weeks and then you have to update it. And updating it is the most painful thing ever. No one ever wants to do it. So you check the box, it's done. Hopefully someone else will have to deal with it next. With solutions in spatial computing, you can just have that expert go back and redo the step-by-step uh, -step tutorial, 20 minutes, they're done. Uh, institutional knowledge is lost as workers retire. I think we've already talked about that. Uh, and certainly the increasing complexity. Even in wastewater management, they're bringing on IoT. They're bringing on new technology. Um, I love asking audience questions. How many people have had a chance to see the Bill Gates uh, special on Netflix? Has anyone seen that yet? Okay, please go see that because they talk about wastewater. And I've never thought I'd be excited to talk about wastewater in addition to the work we're doing at King County. But that technology is something about, I think, 100 years old or more. There's literally been zero innovation in wastewater management around the world. And one of the things that Bill Gates is doing is funding uh, development into improving that. And uh, we think we're kind of on that path as well. Um, I think it's rather obvious uh, that you can have data locked, uh, in individual isolated systems. And then again, it's wastewater. Who wants to work in wastewater? It's very difficult for them to attract talent. Together with the work that they've done with us uh, and some others, uh, we really think that we're making it a much more attractive workplace environment. And again, getting them excited about the work that they're doing and, and sharing it. So um, this is a dual slide. Uh, on the left, we're gonna show, uh, it's actually Denise. Uh, building something over that belt loader. And this is the training that the individual ran in a, in a simulation on a, on a digital twin. So she's in the process of dragging down the markers. Again, spending about two to three minutes per step. I think it was a 13 step operation. Uh, and then she was done. And then we have the trainee coming in. He's passed his certification exam. <coughs> excuse me. And now he's on the actual machine. The great thing is he's already seen all the steps on that digital twin. So he knows exactly what he needs to do. It's not that much of a leap to go from a scale model of what you're supposed to be operating to the actual machine itself. And we see in particular, and I'll give you some stats in just a moment, the amount of error reduction uh, is fantastic. So we know that by giving people greater familiarity with something before they actually do it, they commit less errors. So what does this mean, spatial computing and manufacturing? So again, four examples, upper left, sorry, upper right. Uh, this is some work we did with Jable. Uh, Jable is a medical device manufacturer. Uh, what we were able to do uh, with spatial computing is uh, create a 3D model of a blood pump uh, that a, a nurse or a nurse pr practitioner would interface with. And Jable was very interested in building a product that would be able to have user feedback as part of the development process. And so within this 3D model at scale, we superimposed a holographic interface and then had the nurse practitioner go through the various steps that they would need to go through with the physical device, but clicking instead of pressing buttons. And based on that experience, they were able to give feedback on how to build a more effective or more ergonomically correct uh, machine uh, for patients. 
the next one is some work we did with Shell Wind Farms. Um, I think we've seen a lot of examples of what authoring looks like. Um, the interesting case in this point was uh, this individual, all engineers working on wind farms are not allowed to bring paper materials into the worksite uh, because of the fear of being outdated. And so what we were able to do uh, working together with the subject matter expert is create a set of instructions that is easily updatable, easily followed, and makes their jobs a lot easier in terms of onboarding new uh, individuals. Because you can imagine, if you're someone who's just entering uh, this as a career, and then you're told you're not allowed to bring any notes into what you're doing, that's really challenging. I mean, there's a lot of people that might say, that sounds like a great job, but then I did it for a week, it was terrible, I'd never want to do it again. And so we're convinced that with our tools, and certainly spatial computing, uh, we're able to get people up to speed faster, and again, committing less errors. The next example is actually we shot in Las Vegas. This is a millwright. Uh, this is a, uh, a union uh, that creates training uh, that is then goes across the United States. Um, I think this was an interesting case for us because it was one of the first times we were really pushing the, uh, the HoloLens in terms of how they were able to see uh, 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 gestures through gloves. Uh, and we were successful with that. Uh, and then adding the videos and what have you uh, was also very beneficial. And then our fourth example is the work we did with Flow uh, water jets. So these are absolutely massive machines. Uh, I think they weigh an order of three or four tons, and then you have to ship a ton of water with them. So they're using high water pressure to cut through pretty much anything. And uh, Flow approached us because they love to sell these at uh, expos and conferences. Uh, the problem is shipping these things is exorbitantly expensive. So what could we do in terms of creating a digital twin that their salespeople would be able to uh, just take a HoloLens or a Magic Leap with them, throw on the device, and walk customers through the experience? Exactly the same use case in terms of the step-by-step -step instructions, except this time looking at it from a, from a sales or a marketing perspective. Uh, and so now Flow is outfitted to do this all over the world, again, through spatial computing. So, defense. Again, four examples. We're going to start at the top right. Uh, this is uh, manifest in action over uh, the cockpit of an A380. Uh, I can't remember if this is landing or taking off. One of the two. Both two very important uh, operations of a plane. Uh, this is a pilot who's creating a step-by-step -step instruction on how to uh, land this plane. Uh, we were super excited about the opportunity uh, to uh, create this one because it's almost a simulator inside a simulator. And so we, ha we hadn't done that before. So that, uh, that was a lot of fun. Uh, and again, it's the classic hallmarks of having the millimeter of down to two millimeters level of accuracy in the pointers, the video content there, the, the PDF written instructions, uh, et cetera. And we've taken that and now started working on the repair and mechanics side of a couple of airlines. And one of the things I learned uh, through this experience is by the time the end, I think the lifetime, by the end of a life of a plane, I think there's over 450,000 documents. And so every time there's any kind of revision, a new document needs to be created. And then those documents need to follow with the repairs and make sure that they're up to date and the mechanic caught everything, et cetera. And so uh, airlines in particular are very, very interested in spatial computing. Um, more with the iPad, because they already all have iPads, so we're very happy to support them. Uh, but we know as more and more AR devices come online for, for industrial use, we know that they're going to be adapting uh, those as well. In, uh, let's see here. I'm just trying to advance this. Give me just one second. I have to do this manually. See anything moving? Oh, here we go. Perfect. OK. Um, so this is someone who uh, is doing a training uh, in an office or in a meeting room. Uh, they're reviewing uh, the process of uh, how to repair uh, a pump. Uh, in a lot of cases, this is kind of delving back into the manufacturing side, but when a manufacturing line isn't running, they're not making any money. 
So they're very interested in keeping those lines running at all times, and anything that we can do to help them to simulate uh, the experience uh, is very, very attractive. So in this case, uh, we worked with some 3D models in a classroom environment and walked this individual through uh, the steps it takes to repair uh, this pump. Uh, and then he was able to do it on a pump uh, that was actually created or, or put in the office, uh, so not impacting the, the manufacturing line. So he was able first to do it on a digital twin, second to do it on a physical device. Again, getting familiar with the steps on a digital twin first, and then making the investment in time to do it on a physical device. And our last example for defense, uh, this is the US Marine Corps forward operating uh, process where this individual needs to get a generator up and running as quickly as possible. Um, this was a great one for us to work on uh, because, as you can see, it's outdoors. And to date, a lot of the device manufacturers have said, our device works great indoors, it works great indoors. And then they don't really promote much stuff happening outdoors. We pushed it to the limit. Uh, the US Marine Corps is very excited about this opportunity. And we said, well, we'll give it a shot. And uh, we're very fortunate. Uh, it worked great. Um, the video doesn't reflect it, but the HoloLens really did a fantastic job in terms of capturing a step that would, say, occur at this corner of the stage, and then the second step about, what is that, maybe eight meters, six meters this way. Uh, and the spatial recognition worked well enough, even outdoors, uh, for this individual to follow one step to the other to complete the task, which was great. Okay, again. Whoop, might have clicked one too many. Okay. So I said earlier that we've got some really interesting stats. So the, the first one is what New Zealand Army has seen, and this has been reflected with many other customers, uh, but uh, the NZA was very interested in capturing this. Uh, a 36 reduction in errors. Now, when you make an error in manufacturing, it certainly affects the bottom line. It could very well be dangerous. Um, when you start making errors in the military, people die. and so. Uh, defense industry in particular is very, very, very interested in making sure that they can reduce errors. Uh, and we were able to demonstrate this uh, significantly with the New Zealand Army. The other side, uh, back in the US, uh, the Air Force Institute of Technology reduced even more errors uh, comparing to traditional methods uh, to, to what they experienced uh, with our solutions uh, and augmented reality in general. Again, this is game-changing stuff. This, this affects either the bottom line or people's lives, uh, and it's really spatial computing uh, that is making this available. Uh, last but not least, uh, the work we're doing with safe boats. Has anyone walked by our stand? Uh, we're in the Unity stand. We're also with Magic Leap. Uh, this is what we're demonstrating on the stand. Uh, safe boats is a lot like uh, the work we did with Flow, water jet. Uh, Big, expensive shipping uh, of these devices. This is a, uh, a watercraft for battle. Uh, US Coast Guard is a customer, as well as many other militaries around the world. You can imagine these things are huge and heavy, uh, but they really wanted to figure out a way that they could walk customers through uh, demos uh, in the sales environment uh, and not have to ship a, a massive watercraft. As you can see here, it's 85 feet in length, so I have roughly 30 meters. Um, and what we're able to do, and you can witness it on our stand if you come by, is take a look at the boat in a pretty good size. I don't think we actually do it to scale. That would be ridiculous, but it's pretty big. Uh, and then we walk through all the features of the boat. So it's a, it's a cool, cool demo. The other demo I've got going on is how to repair a A380 uh, landing strut. So if anyone wants to spruce up their skills in the aircraft maintenance, uh, they certainly can do that uh, with what we're presenting today. And the most important is we're able to do this cross-device. And this is really the power of Unity. And we've long been a partner of Unity, uh, and it's made uh, our existence um, possible. Uh, certainly, we started uh, by developing for the HoloLens. We're developing now for the HoloLens 2. Certainly, Magic Leap is a big partner of ours. We're showcasing on their stand. Um, we do dabble in some VR. Uh, I happen to be a huge, huge fan of the Oculus Quest. Uh, I know that's going to be a, a platform we're going to be embracing very, very soon. And then we're available on, on iPad. 
Now, if only this AR Foundation stuff had been announced two years ago, it would have made our lives a lot easier. Um, but I was absolutely thrilled uh, to hear about AR Foundation uh, last night. I'm not sure if many folks were at the keynote. Uh, for me, that was an absolutely terrific moment. And I know our developers are, are really excited about that as well. So, so thank you, Unity, for continuing to push the boundaries and make things easier for developers like Tactile uh, to create compelling solutions uh, for customers around the world. With that, I'm going to wrap up on key takeaways, and I'm going to hand it over to Elena to, to give us some uh, experiences that we've had uh, with Unity. Um, ultimately, uh, we're seeing just great results from a mixed reality environment training. And it's not necessarily just our solution that's providing this. There are some great companies out there that are in the same space, and by embracing spatial uh, computing, they're able to really push the envelope uh, and bring a lot of what are very, very traditional industries uh, up to the forefront of, uh, of technology. And so that's great. Um, of course, there's, uh, we've been able to see some significant boosts in productivity. We've already talked about the reduction in errors. Uh, and then ultimately, what I love more than anything is giving some agency to these frontline workers. These are men and women whose jobs allow us to do ours. And they're super, super important. And they've been second or third class citizens forever as technology has been introduced. And it's solutions like ours that really, and our, our partners, bring them to the table so that they can actually provide input to make their own experiences better, their own lives better, and really just kind of keep this world turning. So we're super, super excited to be part of that process. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Alena. Yeah. Uh, hello, and uh, I want to talk about some best practices that Tactile uses. So that means that uh, we made a lot of mistakes, and you guys hopefully can benefit from us escaping some of our mistakes at least. Uh, the first item is about uh, cross device. So, as um, John already told us, and this is really kind of first and foremost reason for us to use uh, Unity as a tool at this point. Mm because um, they really know strong leaders in the hardware space and uh, almost all of the devices that are released uh, now have uh, Unity support out of the gates. Uh, so it's an important tool for us to reduce expenses. Uh, one of the things for developers is using platform in a, in a kind of uh, environment of variables. And also... When you deal with different uh, platforms, it's important how easy you can get a part of your code and uh, um, start any gifts for different devices. Um, on the rapid application development, uh, we found that usually you spend a lot of time on such uh, design mode stuff, uh, but as Unity is such a, a quick tool to deal with, it's uh, been better for us to work in a bit different way. Uh, like, let's come up with an idea, do a quick implementation of it, uh, just by kind of uh, looking mockups, and uh, let's ask the developer, so let's try like this, does it work? So in this case, we can uh, iterate quickly different ideas and uh, serve the, them in real cases. Uh, what about next point? Um, a great benefit of Unity is that um, there is a whole marketplace of plugins that you can take and manage up. But I want to vote you uh, that you have uh, that. We, res we research carefully each one of them. Um, yes, plugins obviously uh, do have um, support behind them, but you should check all the platforms. Even if there are not the ones uh, you're worrying about supporting right now, they could be easily be the ones you're supporting, you're worrying about supporting in the future. Uh, on the 3D modeling, uh, area, it's obvious that you have to be smart about using GPU resources. Uh, basically, with the same type of care that you take with optimizing for bubble, but even um, more restrictive uh, with some of the special computing asset. Um, 
yeah, about build release management. And this is a kind of obvious thing, but uh, really, if you can focus on using the LTS releases uh, when possible. Uh, we've made some risky cho choices uh, to just upgrade Unity and uh, had everything work worked as expected. But you really need to have a good test plane if you are going to upgrade your last Unity version. Because, you know, there is also downgrading. And uh, if something goes wrong and you need to downgrade your product, it could be really hard work. So, <laughs> when Saying you... that based on experience. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, when you're moving those major releases, uh, do have a test plane <laughs> in place and maintain your, vers your version just in case, yeah, your stable version. Uh, so now let's move forward to what's next for tactile at first and then for the whole industry. Um, basically, we are worrying about uh, migrations and testing of uh, new versions of Unity. It's I really should say migrating to AR Foundation. We need to update that as of last night. Super excited about that. <laughs> yeah. Right, sorry. It's a big challenge because uh, we don't we don't have uh, automatic testing for these steps, and it basically goes to the staff of manual manner. Uh, but we need to update to the latest version of versions of Unity to have post support for HoloLens 2 and other devices and some other features that are supported only in the 2019 version. Uh, as I just said, uh, we are looking for a HoloLens 2 porting and testing what's going to be involved there. And uh, it's also a related point below. It's about a mixed reality toolkit upgrade. Uh, it's not some sort of backwards compatible thing. We need to do some rewrites in code uh, in order for that to work. So uh, these three are interrelated. Um, another thing that is really important for us is uh, that we have a um, cloud environment that we used to deploy through our test customers. Uh, but when the industry is focused on um, just uh, this stuff, uh, they want to host on-premise all these technologies. And so uh, we also look for possibility to make our stuff decorized and use different services, but keep them independent. For example, in HoloLens, we have such thing like uh, uh, speech-to-text. Uh, and it doesn't work in other platforms, and now we're uh, looking for a possibility to make it independent. And uh, yeah, we are also working on big mutual uh, remote assist. And uh, now I um, talk about this because it's really a game-changing technology, which involves also pushing the limits of uh, what a mentor can do. Uh, so, not only displaying, but uh, this remote assist should allow um, work together, like a real-time interaction. Uh, so, it could be like a junior operator has a problem, then he calls a mentor who can uh, help him through some work tasks in real time. Um, the next item is pure camera caption. It's about moving beyond the headset or having an additional venue so that we can use external cameras and so on, and uh, user can capture skeletal finger and finger tracking and uh, all this stuff comes together. Uh, yeah, and there is also a lot to talk about edge computer, but I will not talk <laughs> a lot. <laughs> uh. Um, uh, this really has a potential to decentralize priorities in network traffic uh, that within will allow to a new epoch of use cases. That's about moving data structures from photo to video, video to 360 video, 360 video, point, point cloud, and point cloud can, uh, environment can um, just uh, capture all these kinds of things, and uh, it will put a lot of pressure on network. So edge computing is one of the uh, paths to resolve that. And uh, there is one more sort of re-mentioning uh, re thing, uh, with mixed reality, you have this pipeline of CAD models and um, 
And so I'm going to walk that uh, tries to optimize and to get a solution to make that much easier for customers and doesn't matter for HoloLens or Magic Leap or any other devices. I'm just going to add one more to here. Uh -huh. So <clears throat> based on the keynote last night, I think all the BIM stuff, super compelling. So we can absolutely expect that to be woven into our HoloMaps offering as a part of Manifest. I don't know how many people saw the BIM announcement last night, but really, really, really cool. So being able to kind of combine those two worlds is, is super exciting for, for companies like Tactile. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, sorry. Yeah, uh, so what's next for the industry? Uh, for the whole industry, I think not only us, but a lot of people are looking for a real deployments. So not pilot versions or just concepts, but a real company which deploys a product with thousands or hundreds of users hundreds or thousands, and uh, a tactiles had it uh, work really done, but I think we're still waiting for that inflection moment when pass adoption becomes, becomes vis visible. Um, so that kind of uh, losing operation ready hardware. Uh, part of uh, what's been available of the hardware that we've seen to accomplish these tasks still not as early waiting. So uh, we expect that founders will resolve that problems, uh, but there is still a gap with the uh, creation of many hardware. We do love our hardware partners. Let me just say that, though. <laughs> yeah. Some great hardware out there. Yeah, but, but we can always get What's better. next? Yeah, what's, what's next? next? Yeah, true. So, uh, exciting training room. So, as tactile, we're working on this perception, and it's just tech for the training room for visualization and simulation. And we really are focused on getting this operational, working hard to spell the perception about this being training room technology. Great, thanks, Elena. So, we've got three minutes and 40 seconds for questions. Uh, if you do have a question, Got a couple of mics left and right, so feel free to approach those. I will not be throwing up code samples, so please don't dive in. Go ahead. I thank you for the presentation. Uh, I had a question about the, um, the way you recognize the models. I saw you using markers. Have you used other techniques as well? Uh, to date, we are uh, still focused on the, the QR code, the 3D spatial marker. Um, we are able to kind of weave that into barcode, so a lot of our customers have existing coding structures on their devices. And so we uh, use a set of tools to kind of update them into something that either the HoloLens or, or other devices can read. Thank you very much. Sure. Hello, thank you for your talk, very interesting. Great. Uh, my question is, um, when using AR technology on site, one of the greatest challenges, it, uh, at least in my experience, is is uh, aligning your virtual content precisely with the real world. Um, now, just want to know what your experience on that is. Ours works perfectly every time, <laughs> all the time. So. Uh, no, uh, and this is not a dig at our hardware partners. We love what they do. Um, but that is, that is something that takes continued effort on all of our parts. Um, we haven't had a deal go south or an opportunity go south because of it. Um, but we've certainly taken on some feedback, um, and it's, it's something we, we look to improve constantly. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, my question is regarding cross-platform you talked about. Is it uh, like a shared experience, so someone with an uh, HoloLens can watch someone else oh, yeah, using another... Question. AR had said doing his work and supervise them. Right, yeah, thanks for allowing me to, uh, to uh, unpack that a little bit more. So uh, we do have shared experience in our uh, solution. Um, it's usually leader follower. So we have one person who is driving, uh, you know, clicking through the steps, uh, and then we have another person who is viewing. Um, this is a fantastic solution for both training uh, environments inside of a classroom as well as on the line. Uh, a lot of it has to do with uh, not enough devices out there for everyone to get one. We do support HoloLens or HoloLens sharing sessions, but predominantly it's someone with a tablet, iPad, uh, watching someone on a HoloLens or, or vice versa. So, great question. Hi, thanks Hi. for your talk. I had a question about the use case that you showed about the US military where you use the HoloLens outdoor. Right. How did you manage to get the, did you use additional sensors for the registration or uh, I, the default ones? It's just really good coding. No, I have no idea. I, it's, uh, <laughs> I'd like to say magic. Um, 
I can only, so I wasn't at that. I didn't participate in that experience. I did participate in something in a, with a major steel manufacturer here in Europe. Uh, and we had one uh, step, again, that existed, say, on this wall. Another one 50 meters away. And I'm, I'm walking with the Hollands thinking, this is never going to work. There is no way it's going to be over here. And sure enough, when I turned up, it was there. So I don't know if somehow Microsoft made uh, the spatial uh, recognition that much stronger, but it took no additional effort from us. I know eventually we are going to hit a point where it's just going to be not work at all. Um, and I would think that's going to occur in some outdoor environments simply through sunlight. You know, sometimes exactly. the sunlight was, really, really was... screws things up. Um, so far, so good. I hope I'm not jinxing our entire business, but um, we haven't had that be a major uh, showstopper yet. But it's coming, for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so again, for the outdoor case, did you use a f sunlight filter of some sort to make sure that the visualization is bright uh, enough? That's a really good question. I think that we talked about it, but I don't think we actually ended up doing it. Okay. I think we just went with the raw uh, device. As All far right. as I remember, but I mean, I'm at the stand. I'll, I'm going to check. So stop by our, our stand. And you can ask me again, and I'll, I'll get you a, a real answer. Okay. Anything else? Oh, here we go. Thanks for the talk. So I was wondering um, if you noticed any step-by-step -step instructions, some instructions that you cannot turn into step-by-step -step instructions, or what were possibly the problems that you cannot tackle with. That's a really great question. So the only use case that I've seen that, per, that poses significant challenges isn't really around the instructions themselves. It's within movement of the object. So either it's a human being lying on an operating table or something happening within a human being or an animal or something and there's some movement, or it's a device that actually moves and then we have a really hard time figuring out how to tag that step to a device that was here but is now over there and have it be the same step. So I think movement is probably our greatest challenge. Um, again, with some of the newer devices coming online right now, we, we, we haven't really pushed that envelope with them yet. We've heard some talk that it might be uh, addressable, uh, but we don't know yet. But yeah, movement is our, our biggest challenge right now. Okay. But I think if there should be a video, you, you can just <laughs> combine what is in the... Uh, just equipment, how it should look like, and show on the step how to. Uh, yeah, we could do that. What's really that? Yeah, we could. Anything? Any other questions? Okay, great. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the show in Unity. Thanks again for for having us. Thank you.